This program is made possible through generous donations from viewers like you. To pledge your support, please visit arootawakening.tv slash give. Thank you. Wait, you can't do that. Really? Do you always comply when someone says that, or do you ask, why, who says? Now, of course, sometimes it's a matter of what's legal and what's not, but what about legalism that flies in the face of what Yehovah's law says? Traditions that nullify his law, for example. What, what do you do then? Well, if you're like our Messiah, you expose it, deliberately disobey it, and reestablish Yehovah's law as clearly superior, regardless of threats from the men who made the illegitimate law in the first place. Uh, a whole lot of that happened this week in gospel history. It was this week that Yeshua warned people about the leaven of the Pharisees, regardless of being uh, warned himself to say such things uh, by the Pharisees. It opened the eyes of his followers in more ways than one. In fact, it all went down on a day just like today. It was the sixth day after the sun had set, but this is Shabbat Night Live! <laughs> It's going to be a great show tonight. It will be. Stand by, studio. 30 seconds. We certainly did here. Uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is next week. But tonight, we are going to get back into the Karaite Files with Michael Rood and Nehemia Gordon. Took a little bit of a hiatus uh, right there right before Yom Teruah, but now we're going to get right back into it. And also tonight, Bill Cloud is on the program. He's going to do a Q&A session with Michael Rood, and that is coming up in just a few minutes. But first, please welcome my co-host for this evening, the Director of Ministry Development for Rood Awakening International, Annie Reed. Welcome, Annie. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, good to see you. So, yeah, Yom Kippur, right around the corner. Yes, it is. Day and of we, Atonement. It is. This is probably my 10th year, and it's always a little bit different than before. So, uh, But we actually have a love gift teaching on that we very do. subject this month. We do, right here. The Day of Atonement. Uh, there's only, uh, well, there's still a few weeks to get it. Yeah, we're still just right into uh, October. and So you can get the Day of Atonement. Uh, nice photo there of, of what Yeshua might look like uh, in the... Yeah, in the days to come, and uh, this is going to be a great teaching. Uh, let me just read a little bit of the back here. Uh, when Yeshua invited a few select disciples to a mountaintop on the Day of Atonement, yep, that was the Day of Atonement, uh, they witnessed one of the greatest spectacles of all time, which was the Transfiguration. Uh, what the disciples saw on that day offered a glimpse into Yeshua's true identity. Discover the details, however, behind that event with Michael's teaching, the Day of Atonement. As we always know, Michael brings out things you're not normally going to see in black and white, in the Bible. Mm -hmm. He reads between the lines and makes you realize what's really going on here with uh, context and timing and all the rest of it. So, yep. great teaching. Yep. And I continue to learn every single year. I, it's never the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I never observe the holiday or the holy days the same way. Yeah, so. Isn't that funny when people say, well, how can you do that same thing year after year? You know, when some people uh, read the Torah portions and things like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's the, the same feasts obviously come around every time. How can, you, how can it be different every time? Well, if people are doing Christmas and Easter, well, that's pretty much the same thing every year. You know, other than getting a few more ornaments on a tree or something, that doesn't change for yeah. most people. But we're, we're studying these things. That's we're right. studying these things, and that's what makes it different because uh, you find something deeper every year, like you said. Absolutely. And also with this year, I think we should stretch this thing out. When you, this month, I should say, when you get the Day of Atonement teaching, um, if, if you donate uh, a little more, you can get this as well. And this is a throw. I don't know if we're going to be able to even stretch this thing out. It's huge. We can huge. try. It's four by five feet. This thing is massive. And oh, look. It's beautiful. This is one of the best love gifts we've ever had. And there's a prayer of thanksgiving in the middle. You won't be able to read that, obviously. But uh, it's, it's a great gift. And you'll get that along with your love gift teaching. You just throw that on your, your couch and... 
don't know, what do you do with a throw? You throw <laughs> it, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of love gifts, there's definitely a subject that I'd like to discuss, and that's okay. love gifts in the Ambassadors Club, just because there's been a little bit of, a, of confusion in the past. Oh, yeah, we've had some calls on that. Go Absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. So the love gift is different than the Ambassador Club. Uh, the ambassador, Ambassadors Club are individuals who are evangelists. They have a heart to reach the nations, and so they give above and beyond their tithes typically, and this is their offering to help us stay on the air, which is one of the reasons that we're able to go on Sky Angel this year. Right. Now, the love gift is for those that support A Rude Awakening in a very different way, and that's our thanks. That's it's, right. Yeah, you, when you get a love gift, you can't think of it like you're... you're buying this. No. That's not the way we look at it. It's mm -mm. for donating to the ministry through that particular avenue of the love gift. You're going to get these special gifts and that's what it is. They're gifts to you. So that's Absolutely. why we do a, a love gift and that's why it's called as such. We have millions of people watching us on a daily basis and we have a very small portion that support us and so we do want to go above and beyond and thank these individuals differently uh, because that's, they deserve that. Right. They deserve to receive these teachings and we're very grateful that we have the opportunity to, to do that. Right, and we're, we're halfway through these teachings now. This is a set of 20 uh, that we have in the Ministry of the Messiah series. You can get the box and all that, and, and uh, that's all on the mm -hmm. Love Gift page, arudawakening.tv slash lovegift. You can get it all there. Uh, the box, I think, is only uh, five bucks or something like that. And it will hold all of these teachings together uh, so you can have a complete box set like you do with uh, other network shows that you, you, know, you buy a whole season. Mm -hmm. That's the, kind of the idea behind it. Now, uh, speaking of being on television, and you mentioned Sky Angel. We're back on Sky Angel. Correct. And people say, okay, that's great that the Chronological Gospels TV show is coming back. Uh, and you can watch it on DISH, channel 262. But I don't have DISH. I have DirecTV. That's the question we're getting. So what's the answer? The answer is that you can watch us on Aviv TV, excuse me, AvivTV.com. <laughs> but you can also see us on Roku. Oh, Right. So you will be able to find the archived uh, videos there. Right. Now, how you find it on Roku, you don't search the Chronological Gospels or even Michael Rood. The trick is to search Messianic.tv, uh, and then you will find the program there. You'll find Chronological Gospels there. Oh, as, long, as well as uh, Shabbat Night Live and right. a few uh, uh, the first eight mm -hmm. episodes. So we're excited. Yeah, it's very, very good stuff. And uh, when you go to Roku... Uh, you'll see the same program that is being shown on Aviv TV. So don't worry, and on Sky Angel. So don't worry, you're not going to be like a week behind or anything like that. It's all going to be in sync. So you'll be seeing what everyone else sees through those different avenues. Yeah, and, and speaking of Aviv TV, uh, there are seven shows there. I mean, you can watch it every weekend. That's what we have. It's, a, it's an online uh, weekends only network. And you can watch, like we mentioned, uh, you've got uh, Shabbat Night Live, you've got uh, The Health Awakening. The Health Awakening, right, with <laughs> me, and then there's uh, The Body, Soul, and Spirit, and all kinds of other programs. And it's from, uh, from 8 p.m. Friday through 8 a.m. Monday. Mm -hmm. So, literally, just a weekends only uh, thing. And like we said, there's seven shows on there, and uh, that is what we're promoting right now. And our content just continues to get better and better mm -hmm. every single week. We have Bill Cloud on this evening with us. We're excited about the Q&As, but we also have Cole Davis that will be with us in a few weeks. And he actually does a lot of studies on demonology and the Ooh. occult. So that is as we get to the end of uh, October, mm -hmm. when a lot of people are starting to think about uh, trunk or treat and in all this Halloween, nonsense yes. that all of the churches are putting on and all that kind of thing. It's important to know what people are really getting themselves into because most people have no idea. No, no, no. And the doorways can be very simple. And so Cole addresses that very clearly mm. in his interviews with Michael. Very good. Okay. And, and like we said, uh, Bill Cloud is, is on tonight as well. Okay. So now, uh, Yon Teru, as we mentioned, um, you can now get the entire series. If you missed it on, on when we originally had it, that's okay. You can get it for forty nine ninety five. dollars It's right here. And uh, you can get all seven sessions. Um, and now we can mention our secret guest. Yes. Which was Kamal Saleem. And we were just shocked by the knowledge that he shared with us over the weekend. Yeah, he, he was a former Islamic terrorist. And he, he titles himself, or he uh, refers to himself as such. When he was just a little kid, he was smuggling arms into Israel mm -hmm. for Yasser Arafat. Uh, and then he learned to make bombs by the time he was 15 years old. I mean, this guy was deep into it. I know. And he came to America just to recruit. I mean, that was his sole purpose when he first came to America. Yeah, so he was like one of these guys in a sleeper cell that we often hear about. But fortunately, uh, something happened on the road one day. Uh, a bunch of believers came to his aid, 
and have forever changed his mind about what he's doing. Well, we pray that that continues for many people that are in yeah. Islam right now, or yeah. even, you know, not believers at all. Right. And, you know, Yehovah made each one of us, and he That's wants right. everyone to repent and come to him. So we should never give up on somebody, because no. Kamal is living proof that anything, even a, a terrorist can come to Yehovah. That's right. Yeah, it's great. Now, before we, uh, we only got a couple of minutes left, but, so we need to address the calendar. So we are on the, uh, the second, pardon me, the first Shabbat. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to time travel here. We're on the uh, first Shabbat of Tishri. Uh, and that's where, here we are right there. Uh, now we've passed Yom Teruah, as we said, the new moon or the renewed moon, the first sliver of the renewed moon to make it proper, was seen uh, earlier this week. Uh, this is a very interesting time where Yeshua uh, fed the 4,000, uh, right after he fed the 5,000. And, and if you look in the chronological gospels, all these things add up. Uh, Michael ties them together very specifically. And you will see, uh, I'd love to go into it tonight, but we just simply don't have time. But you start looking into the chronological gospels, specifically around uh, events number 114, 115, 116, and you'll start, start to see how the fall feasts start to come together. And uh, we'll just leave that at that uh, and, and let you go and, and, uh, and explore that for yourselves. We were going to talk more about that, but we, I think we're running out of time here. So uh, now, first of all, uh, Michael and Nehemia Gordon are coming up and they're going to talk about the Karaite files. And uh, this is, uh, where are we at? Week four. This is a series of eight and you can pre-order them now. And when the last show airs, I think it's uh, November 4th, we will ship it immediately after to uh, to you there uh, on uh, November 7th, which is the Monday. So that is coming up, and like I said, you can order it now. It's an eight disc set, you can get DVD or Blu-ray, and uh, like we said, it'll be shipped on November 4th. And the beauty of it is, if you pre-order right now, you can save 20% off the regular price of $54.95 and get it for like $43.95. So, stay with us. Q&A with Michael Rood and Bill Cloud is next, followed by the Kerrite Files with Michael and Nehemia. But first, this word from our only sponsor, which is you. <laughs> When Yeshua invited a few select disciples to a mountaintop on the Day of Atonement, they witnessed one of the greatest spectacles of all time, the Transfiguration. It is Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. And what happens on this day? This is when Yeshua is ordained as the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest forever. What they saw on that day offered a glimpse of who Yeshua really was and his glorious authority in the end of days. Discover the details behind the transfiguration in the Day of Atonement, Michael Rood's new teaching, available only with your love gift donation in October. Own the Day of Atonement as a gift from Michael Rood when you donate $50 or more. Or donate $100 or more and you'll also get a beautiful 4 by 5 foot chenille throw, woven with a prayer of thanksgiving. This offer is only available in October. Make your love gift donation now. Well, shalom to our fans. You've known for quite some time that we've had communications from cyberspace and beyond, but now a new method of gathering this information is now coming to us in baskets. And this is the basket of the deplorable. We have communications questions that have come in from the deplorables out there into our basket of deplorables. And to help answer these questions is Bill Cloud from Short Machine Ministries. Welcome, yeah. Bill. Thank you, Good Michael. Good to have you with us. I thought you were going to say something like from Deplorable Bill or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we have uh, we have a lot of uh, so good questions here from the okay. basket of deplorables, and uh, and really the very first one is addressed to you, Bill. And right. uh, and of course, your your ministry is called Shorshi Ministries, right. which is Hebrew for roots. Roots. And so, uh, the question, first one that comes in, Bill, uh, you seem to make a distinction between Hebrew roots and Jewish roots. What's the difference in your mind? Well, in my mind, well, first of all, when I first heard about all of these things, like the Sabbath and the feasts and things like that, I, I equated them with being Jewish. That's the way it was always presented to me. And I heard mm -hmm. people use the term 
Jewish roots. And so I, I used that for a little while, but then I realized that Abraham, I can, well, I can't find anything in Scripture where Abraham was called a Jew. And so I began to understand that it was, it was more than Jewish roots. It was Hebrew roots. It was biblical roots, in other words. Uh, so I, I prefer to use that term because it goes beyond the scope of just being Jewish or the Jewish world. Because with all due respect to our Jewish friends, I'm not trying to be Jewish. I'm trying to be biblical. I'm trying to return to the roots of my faith. And so to use the term Jewish roots, in my view, lends itself to the dilemma that a lot of people find themselves in, in questioning, what do I do? How do I keep Sabbath? Do I have to light candles? Do I have to do, I have to do Havdalah and all these kinds of things? And the Jewish aspect of things gets uh, mixed in with the biblical aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And so I refrain from using the, the term Jewish roots, not to be an offense, but just to kind of reinforce the idea here is that we're trying to be biblical, not necessarily Jewish. I'm not Jewish. Mm -hmm. I'm a follower of the Messiah, and so I'm trying to be like Him. So to kind of summarize that, I, I, I prefer the term Hebrew roots because it, it opens it up to understanding that this isn't about being Jewish. This is about being biblical. Abraham was the Hebrew. He crossed over out of Babylon, left his country, family, father's house. He's going to a land that, that the Creator is going to show him. And so we're crossing over from Babylon. We're coming out of all of those dead ideas and dead systems. We're crossing over from death into life, and we are embracing the word of the Creator. So. Now, now, Bill, uh, you were brought up in the Christian world uh, uh, through your studies, through the years. You have a, uh, a a very good command as far as research command of the Hebrew language. Uh, you, you understand that uh, you know so many concepts. Uh, you know they really need to be related from its uh, the, the the Hebrew source, its yes. background. Yes. Uh, Hebrew in itself means well, it, it's derived from avar to cross over. That's, he's called, Abraham is called, when he's still Avram, Ha-Ivri, the Hebrew. That's right. The one that's the crossed Hebrew. over. And so from that is derived the term Hebrew and the Ivri, the Hebrew language. Mm -hmm. So, yes, and so understanding, which it's not the Jewish language, it's the Hebrew language. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we, we, I believe, get a better grasp on concepts and principles and precepts when we understand that it was written from a Hebrew perspective. So that's another feature mm -hmm. of what we're talking about here. It, when we are turning to, returning and embracing the Hebrew roots of our faith, we're getting back to the language, the mindset, because it's more than a language, it's more than a culture. It's a way of thinking. Uh, this is related in my mind, I hope it doesn't seem unrelated to others, but I do find it interesting that in Revelation chapter 17, the scarlet clothed harlot, she has an epithet written upon her forehead, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. It's written on her forehead is interesting to me because that alludes to the mind, the way of thinking. And so there is this Babylonian mixed, mingled, let's coexist kind of way of thinking Mm. And a Hebrew way of thinking is has to come out of that. It has to, it has to come from that way of thinking. We have to have our minds renewed, and we have to start thinking the way this is written. And, and to quote a very good friend of mine, I'm, I'm, I know that you know Brad Scott. Uh, Brad reminds us uh, many times with humor that the Messiah was not a Swedish Presbyterian. So we can't think like a Swedish Presbyterian. We can't think. We can't even think necessarily like Jews in the sense of rabbinical Judaism. We have to think in terms of what is written, not what man says. Mm -hmm. So kind of bringing it full circle, uh, I don't mean any disrespect by it, but I don't prefer the term Jewish roots because it seems to put limits on it as far as I'm concerned. Well, I, I think that you really are, from my perspective, making a, a very important distinction on this because uh, modern day Judaism is ancient Phariseeism. Yeah. It, it, there, there is no difference. I mean, it is proudly held to and attested to. 
To be a rabbi today means that you have to be ordained by a rabbi who is ordained by a rabbi that goes back before the first century. The Pharisees were around, and we have the writings that go back 300 years before Yeshua. Uh, they, it is a religious uh, uh, sect that added literally hundreds and hundreds of commandments to the commandments we received at Mount Sinai that says no one is ever allowed to add one single commandment or diminish one commandment so that we may keep all the commandments of the Lord our God. Yeah. Because once you add to or subtract from, you no longer have the commandments of God. You have a man-made religion. And so Jewish and Judaism comes with that connotation of all these extra rules and regulations added on, traditions of men that we are told specifically not to obey, not to follow these things. Well, you know, Michael, I, when I left or came out of mainstream Christian thinking, you know, with all of the man-made things that had been added to and all those things that had been taken away. And I sifted through my, what I believe. Um, I lay aside a lot of traditions. I lay aside a lot of customs that I come to realize weren't commanded. And I didn't lay those customs and traditions aside just to go over here onto the other side of the road and pick up another handful of tra uh, traditions and customs mm -hmm. that men had implemented. So I, I strive, I want to be biblical. I want, to, I want to do what is commanded. I want to live a life that is uh, a reflection of what is commanded. I'm striving toward that goal. I, I certainly haven't arrived, but I do think it's important to very quickly distinguish between the fact that there are things that the Creator has commanded, and then there are things that have been added to and have been taken away on both sides of the, the road, so to speak. And, and so for that reason, and, and as well as the things that we've discussed, I don't use the term Jewish roots because so many people coming, just now coming into this uh, awakening that, hey, all of God's Word is for all of God's people. We need to keep His Sabbath. And so who has, uh, as far as we know from a mainstream Christian point of view, done this throughout Time. Well, it's our, our Jewish friends and neighbors. So we look mm -hmm. to them to know how to do these things. But when we do that, we're also opening ourselves up to all of their customs, all of their traditions. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we could go mm -hmm. on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's why I, I prefer the term Hebrew roots. And, you know, some people say, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I'm just trying to, to do what God said. You know, whatever we want to call ourselves. But I, I do think it's important to distinguish those things. Well, and Yeshua really made that distinction. I mean, he put the plumb line down between the rules and regulations that men had made up, which was uh, Phariseeism in his day, and what Moses said. And one of the greatest discoveries, uh, uh, as now I believe it's in a, a total of 28 of the ancient Hebrew manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew that have been found in, in various uh, Jewish sources and archives around the world, uh, solved a very big problem for us, where as Yeshua uh, said, you know, in his last sermon on the Temple Mount, just uh, two days before his crucifixion, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat whatsoever he, Moses says, do, but do not follow the Takanot Masim of the Pharisees, the things that they've added, their innovations. You know, it, it's good that they, they have kept the, uh, the they, they have kept some of these things such as the feast that without them doing it, they would have been lost to antiquity. Yes, right, exactly. And, and we'd have no idea, there'd be no remembrance of these things that we used to do in the temple. But the traditions we have now in modern day Judaism are not what we did in the temple, they are to remind us of what we did in the temple. Well on that note, uh, let me say this, I, I'm not against customs necessarily until customs are elevated to being equal to what God said. Or supersede, or supersede. In, in, uh, in the case of this. If, if a custom or if a tradition helps us to keep the commandment, I don't necessarily find fault with that. It's just that because we are inclined to be religious in how we approach God, we have this tendency, whether it's from a Christian point of view or a Jewish point of view, we have a tendency to make our customs part of our religious practice and we have to do this, we have to do that, we can't do this. And, and, and so I, you know, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not 
I'm not going to uh, denigrate every custom. I would just take issue with those times when custom is elevated or made superior to what God said. Uh, Bill, I, I think we could go on for oh, quite a, a long, bit on long this. Time. Uh, I, I want you to come back because I, I want to continue on this uh, a, a little bit. So uh, uh, please join us again next time on Shabbat Night Live. We've got more questions from the basket of deplorables, but until we have ferreted this out and gone back to the shore team, back to the roots, earnestly contending with the, for the faith once delivered to the saints, we're going to have to say goodbye for now. And we'll be back right after this message for our sponsors, you out there. Thank you. Michael Rood's Message of Truth is broadcast all over the world, but none of it happens without the monthly financial support of our Ambassador Club members. And right now, membership has more benefits than ever. I'm giving into a ministry that is helping to feed other people that have the same hunger that I do. Join now and Michael Rood will send you the Ambassador Club Welcome Kit, an exclusive messenger bag stocked with teaching DVDs, Red Sea Crossing cards, and more. You'll also receive ambassador-only bonus gifts whenever you make a separate donation to receive the monthly love gift. Best of all, you'll get ambassador-only sale prices in our online bookstore several times throughout the year. Plus, exclusive invitations to Ambassador Club functions at Arood Awakening events. All it takes is a modest commitment of $100 per month or an annual gift of $1,200. Call now or visit the Arood Awakening website to join the Ambassador Club. Traditions that we inherited from Babylon through Constantine have us occasionally with a little plastic cup and a little round wafer in a church service having what is called communion. But Yeshua was not having communion with his disciples. It was the last meal before his crucifixion, which happened at the time the Passover lambs were being sacrificed the following morning. Yeshua took this opportunity to explain something that had been embedded in the, the Israelite culture for then over a thousand years. Mel Exotic brought forth bread and wine to Abraham and he blessed the Most High saying, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Yeshua said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. And so we break this bread and we do it in remembrance of him. Likewise, Yeshua took the cup and he blessed the Most High with that blessing that Melchizedek blessed the Most High. Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah our Elohim, the King of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. Yeshua said, this represents my shed blood, which will be poured out for the remission of sin. I will not drink another drop of the fruit of the vine. You take my cup and divide it among yourselves because I won't drink it until I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will lift this cup and he will say, Baha'i, to life everlasting. And until then, we remember what he's done and remember that marriage supper of the Lamb Get ready. was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps, stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, Camp Geiger itself, which is the home of the 8th Marine Infantry. It was at that time that I drove through Smithfield, North Carolina. As we entered the city, a huge billboard, larger than any billboard that you normally send the highway, welcoming me to the city. It says, welcome to Smithfield, North Carolina, 
home of the Ku Klux Klan. And there was a man dressed in white with a flaming sword on a horse. Uh, and this was the welcome to Smithfield. It wasn't a Smithfield ham, it was the Ku Klux Klan. My surprise in 2011, just before the Feast of Shavuot, Nehemi Gordon came to our studios here, just coming back from what he said was the Smithfield Revival. That was the only way he could explain it. It turned out that he was invited to go to Smithfield and to speak. And he didn't want to go by himself, so he called up Keith Johnson. The two of them went together. And so there, uh, unbeknownst to them, they went into Smithfield, North Carolina, a Jew from Israel, a black man from North Carolina going into Smithfield. <laughs> and what happened right behind the home of the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in that congregation, <clears throat> that is where the Smithfield revival began as Nehemi began teaching on the name of the Most High. To prove that the name of the Most High delivers us from certain death, Nehemi Gordon is here with us today. He made it out of the Smithfield revival <laughs> in one piece. And then after that, you went on to China. Yeah. And had a most amazing experience. It, it really was an amazing experience. But I, you know, you brought up Smithfield, so I've got to talk about that. I want to share what happened there. And it's in the open door series. So I'm just going to get a little taste yeah, of it. Th th that's right. And this is where it all started in, yeah. the, in the first episode. Well, I, what, what happened is I, we had gone, I went with uh, this place to speak at this uh, Sunday morning church in, uh, uh, in Smithfield, North Carolina, and came back to Charlotte, which is about an hour from Smithfield. And, um, and I mentioned to Keith, you know, uh, I got some email about Michael's got some office in Charlotte and they invited me to come see his studio. And I don't know that I really even wanted a studio. I don't know who has time for that. And we finally decided we would come and visit the studio. We didn't even know you were supposed to be here. I, I don't even think you were supposed to be at the studio, but we walk in and we end up meeting with you. And I just was pouring out of my heart what had just happened. And what had just happened is we were in this Sunday morning church in Smithfield. Keith was preaching on the name and he did something I've I've seen people do the altar call, you know, I don't know, many, many times the, you know, the 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 Jesus altar call. Keith did something different. He was proclaiming the name Yehovah, and uh, and then he said to the people who and he, he said something really profound. He said, talked about making the Jews jealous of this name, and he said, Who is willing to dedicate themselves to this name, the name of our Heavenly Father, Yehovah? And the people got up and they were dedicating themselves to this name, Yehovah. And I felt something, but here's the interesting thing. I wanted to get up and join them, but I knew I wasn't supposed to. I knew that those are the Christians, those are the Hebrew roots people, and I'm in the Jewish box. I can't be involved in things going on in their box. We've got to keep this wall of separation. Mm. And mm. I was you know, sitting there really minding my own, I'll be honest with you, while Keith was speaking, I was playing Angry Birds on my iPhone. And I'm sitting there playing Angry Birds, and all of a sudden I feel this. I don't even know what he's talking about, and I feel this thing move me. And I felt this pull to get up and respond to this call, and, but I didn't. And it reminded me of something that had happened years earlier in my life. And I made a decision then and there that next time I got that call, I was going to respond to it. And it was a life-changing event for me. Mm -hmm. um, it changed all kinds of things in all kinds of ways. It was things I wasn't comfortable talking about that I, I felt those things are too spiritual. I, I, I can't deal with that, with those things, at least not in a, in a public way. And I decided I needed to share those things. And, and, and opening that door and, and, and making that proclamation that next time the door was open, I, would, I would, wouldn't shut it, I would walk mm -hmm. through. And, and I'm yeah. not going into all yeah. the details, guys. Go get the video yeah, of Open yeah, Door this, Series. This it's is amazing it. I'll, stuff. I'll tell you, people, it, uh, uh, it, it brings tears to my eyes every time I listen to this. To hear Nehemiah's testimony, this is absolutely precious. And this is where it all starts off. This is the beginning of the Open Door Series. When, when this is done, when this is recorded at our Shavuot get-together, uh, then it was obvious, okay, this cannot stop. This is simply the beginning. And so then volume two, we did this at Yom Truah, and this is Proclaim the Name, and then finally a Hanukkah, finished up the series, and it's available, volume one, two, and three. You can't get one without two and without three. Get them all. This is Stand Against the Ban, and that is the ban on the name. 
And I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely profound, profound stuff because this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled today. It's not something in the future. You know, a lot of people, a lot of the Christian world think the return of Jesus is the next thing to happen on the prophetic calendar. And anything you say, they have to interpret as that. No, Bible prophecy is being fulfilled this very day in the land of Israel and around the world. The Holy Spirit is calling, the door is being opened up around the world. And and Naomi was there in Smithfield for that. And, you know, when he was explaining this to me and saying, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's like a, it's like a revival. And it's like, you know, I, it, it, coming well, from and, a Jew. And, and the <laughs> verses that came to me are verses in the Tanakh and especially in the Psalms that I, I think we bring those in there that talk about how Yehovah says, I will revive you. I'll, I, I will bring you back to life is what it literally means. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I realized, wait a minute. So we've been saying revival. That's that Christian thing. We Jews don't do that. But we need revival in the Jewish world. We absolutely do. And he, and he promises he'll give us that. And I think what's happened in the Jewish world is when he gives us revival, we're like, nope, can't do that. Don't want to be involved. No, 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 no. Don't want to hear what you have to say. And we've shut the door in his face and we've got to have that door open. Now, Michael, I don't know if you realize that those three volumes, they cover 18 hours of teaching, nine hours of me, nine hours of Keith. I think you're in there somewhere too. And um, what you may not realize, and Keith and I, you know, we didn't set out to do the Open Door series. You invited right. us to come speak at this conference. We'd had some cancellation uh, the last minute, and we had had this thing happen, and we end up doing a conference, a second conference, and a third conference. Ends up being 18 hours. At the end of that, when these videos came out, Keith and I sat down and we realized something amazing. He had, he had been invited to be on Christian television over the course of a year to do 52 episodes. Right. Um, yeah. He mm -hmm. ended up getting banned from Christian television because he wanted to bring me as, as, a, as a guest and he was speaking the name Yehovah and they said, no, you're off. They pulled him in the middle of the night from Christian television. We calculated that if he had done those episodes, it would have been the same amount of time as these videos. Amazing. So he wouldn't even been available to go to Smithfield, or he would have been he not have been he wouldn't have been available to go to Smithfield. He would not have been available to do these videos and these conferences yep. if he had done those fifty-two episodes of television. But because he was banned from Christian television, this is what produced. And I remember Keith as he was. Um, as, as we were walking out of that situation of him being banned from television and finding out that, I mean, this was his ministry. He was going to be on television for a year. He had, he, had hit yeah. the, he had hit the big time for him. This was his opportunity to share the message he had received. And he, had, and he, had, he said, this is the end of the ministry. There's no, you know, there's no, that's it. I'm going to go do something else. Um, and, um, and God had other plans and mm -hmm. called us to do this thing. And, and really is one of the most amazing things uh, I've ever experienced. The, the, the actual, ex and what's amazing is people watch these videos and they're there with us experiencing it as we're experiencing it. It's not scripted. It's right. just happening as it's happening. It's unbelievable. It's amazing right. stuff. Right. Well, that's kind of been my life ever since, unscripted. You know, I, I can't even plan the stuff that happens. Um, I ended up with going with Keith to, Shang, uh, to um, Hong Kong, uh, China, and speaking, two of our books, one that I wrote, uh, The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus, this book here, this was translated into Chinese in Hong Kong. And then uh, a book I co-wrote with Keith, A Prayer to Our Father, that was translated into Chinese in Hong Kong. And after it was translated, they said, you know, look, we can distribute this in Hong Kong, but we can't distribute it in mainland China. Because mainland China has 70 million Christians, but there's no freedom of religion, you, especially foreigners aren't allowed to teach about faith in China. It's, it's illegal. So um, he said, we have this opportunity to get the book, A Prayer to Our Father, into the hands of 5,000 pastors from mainland China. They're coming for a conference in Hong Kong, but we can only do this if you're willing to give up your loyalty. And I said, I, I'll never give up my loyalty. Uh, I'm a citizen of the United States and a citizen of Israel, and I will not swear allegiance to the People's Republic of China. <laughs> And Keith said, Nehemia, he means your royalty. <laughs> so we gave out 5,000 books, never saw a penny. Um, <laughs> and you had some flat lice while you were at it. <laughs> well, anyway, we end up going after this to Hong Kong to speak about a prayer to our father in the Hebrew Shore versus the Greek Jesus. And we said, we'll only come to Hong Kong if you let us speak in mainland China too. What we didn't know is it's impossible for foreigners to come speak in mainland China. There's a law, a foreign pastor cannot preach in mainland China in the churches. 
But the way they were able to get us in is they said, look, Nehemiah has a master's degree in biblical studies from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He can come into the churches and speak about the history and culture of ancient Israel and the archaeology. And they and not only did we end up speaking in mainland China in underground churches, we even preached in government churches, which is unheard of. They just don't Incredible. allow that. So there I am. And the funny thing is they said... Talk well, about an open door series. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm there, the Karite Jew, with the Methodist minister, and we're preaching this Hebrew message in the, not only in the underground churches, but in the in the government churches, where they're, they told us there's spies in the church. Don't say anything about the government. Whatever you say will be reported on Monday morning to the communist authorities. It's not maybe. We know this for a fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the pastor of one of the churches told me, he says, I have a meeting every Monday morning, and I tell the, the, the authorities what happened in church that on Sunday morning. And that's not the spy. That's just the pastor. That's, that's his pastor official job reporting. to report back to the government. Then their spies will tell them what really happened. You know, So um, it was an amazing experience. I ended up mm. staying for a year in China. Um, I ended up getting a job as an English teacher in China, which I never, I mean, look, part of it was that I was going through some difficult personal things in my life and I needed a break from ministry. As you know, Michael, mm -hmm. ministry takes everything you have out of you. It takes uh, not just physically, emotionally, spirit. it takes everything, it's draining. And I decided I needed a break. So I ended up getting this job as a high school teacher in China, teaching English. And, and we'll show up here on the screen. Um, uh, me standing in China, I went to, ended up going to the Great Wall of China, Roll Tide. And then I was uh, a high school teacher. I had 658 high school students. And uh, here in this picture, you can see I'm, I'm with some of my students who are twins. Um, I actually had a lot of twins. There's yeah. ma many sets of twins I had. Um, and that's because they had a one-child policy. So you can get around that if you have, uh, if if you you have, have twins. twins. Yeah. But there I was in China teaching high school, teaching English to 658 students. I had no idea how to do that. I, I was terrified the first day. I don't know how to teach English. I don't know how to teach high school kids. And, you know, I've made the joke when I did prison ministry that I've always wanted a, a captive audience. And, um, and the prisoners don't laugh at that. They don't think it's funny. But <laughs> you know, I think it's hilarious. But they're actually not a captive audience because in the prison, they could decide whether they go to, they have to be in prison. They're captives, mm -hmm. but they're not captive to the chapel, to the, to the right. teaching event. Mm -hmm. They can go in the yard and whatever they else they do in prison. But in high school, they were a captive audience. They had no choice but to be in class. So there I am teaching 658 high school students in China. They're 15 and 16 year old boys and girls. And I said, well, what do you want me to teach? They said, well, our students know grammar really well. In fact, they probably know grammar better than you do. And, um, and I'll just give you an example. I had students who would ask me, they'd, they'd say, they'd say, Lauscher, teacher, is chair a countable noun or an uncountable noun? And I would say, um, there is no such thing in English. They'd say, yes, there is. It's how you know the difference between a, you can say a chair, but you can't say a weather. Weather is not a countable noun, and chair oh. is. I'm like, I didn't know we had that. I just know how to speak the language. <laughs> and, we, and in Hebrew as well, it's just, you know, just like in English. Mm -hmm. But Chinese has no such thing. So they have to learn for each word in the English language. Is it a countable noun or an uncountable oh, noun? Yeah. Never Amazing. thought of it. I know. Deer, so, fish. Right. Well, yeah. so that, well, you can say a deer, but you, again, you can't say a weather. So, so they knew grammar better than I knew English grammar. So the point was, they said, we don't need you to teach our students grammar. They know it better than you do. What we want you to teach them about is your culture. I said, my culture? I said, Warsher Yo Tyren, I'm Jewish. You want me to teach my culture? And they were excited when they heard this. And they knew before I came that I was Israeli, but they didn't connect that with Jewish necessarily. Um, they said, oh, you're, you're Jewish. And every person I met in China had the same response when I said I was Jewish. And, and I have to say the Chinese culture hasn't, they don't have political correctness quite yet. So they think in stereotypes. And mm -hmm. when I said I was Jewish, they'd say, oh, Jewish, very smart, very rich. And, and I said, well, not exactly. <laughs> if I was very rich, I wouldn't be teaching high school to 658 <laughs> brats in China. I would be sitting on the beach in Hainan sipping lemonade. But I am very smart. I accept that. I agree. <laughs> and they said, this is wonderful. If you teach our students about your culture, it'll unlock the secret for them to becoming very smart and very rich. In other words, they oh. believed that there must be something in the Jewish culture that makes them very smart and very rich. And if I would share that with the, the students, they would become very smart and rich, which hmm. was their objective in life, to be rich at least. Anyway, so there I am 
in China. I said, well, what about my culture do they specifically want to hear? And they said, Chinese people love to hear about three things. They love to hear about food, travel, and holidays. And the ideal Chinese story is you go on holiday, you go on vacation traveling during the holiday, and you eat a special type of noodles. And I literally would have colleagues who would go away on vacation during the um, Chinese New Year holiday, and they would come back and show me pictures on their Huawei phone, and it would, they would say to me, these are the noodles I ate in Guilin. And I would say, really, those are the noodles you ate last night here in, in town? They're like, no, very special noodles, special <laughs> spice. <laughs> and this was a big deal to them that it was special noodles with special spice. So there I am. And I end up <laughs> teaching classes about food, Jewish food, don't eat pork. They were shocked by that. My oh. students looked at me and they said, how are you alive? And I said, I, I think you seem to be doing pretty well. <laughs> no dog, no cat. Yeah. Well, wow. I, I can't say that the Chinese eat cat because I didn't see that. Oh. But I saw hmm. dogs hanging skinned and quartered in the marketplace. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know that for a fact they eat dog. And they would say, well, we don't eat it all the time, only when we're cold in the winter. Hmm. That's what they do. Anyway, I end up teaching uh, about a lot about the holidays. One of my first classes was about Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. You're, you're teaching this in a secular, oh, yeah. communist-controlled absolutely this high is, school. This is a, high, a private, secular high school. I had 658 students. Three of them were Christians. One of them was a Muslim. The other 654 were atheists who occasionally worshiped their ancestors. And they would tell me, Mayo Shangdi, there's no such thing as God. And I would say, I'm not trying to teach you that there's such a thing as God. I'm trying to teach you what the Jewish culture is. It's illegal to proselytize, but I'm a Jew. I don't proselytize. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't trying to convince them of anything. I was telling them, this is my culture. And they loved that. They appreciated it. And they really believed they'd somehow get rich from understanding the Jewish culture. It's not mm -hmm. even a joke. So anyway, there I am in China. And um, I end up teaching a class about Sukkot. Uh, I taught them that my ancestors were slaves in Egypt and the God of Israel, whose name was Yehohua, that's the Chinese of Yehovah. And it's actually written in the Chinese Bible, Yehohua. Um, and so my, all my students knew that the God of the Otairan of the Jews is Yehohua, that he took us out of the land of Egypt into the desert and he proclaimed to us from the, cloud, from the, the, the top of the mountain, he said, Anochi Yehovah Elohecha, I am Yehovah, your God. And all my students, they learned this and, and they, you know, they thought this is fascinating, the Jewish culture. Don't even learn that in, uh, in Christian church in America. You don't? Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and look, here's how, how, I, how I explained it to them, and they really appreciated this. So Sukkot coincided that year with the Mooncake Festival. And I said to them, you know, this is your big holiday, your, one of your third biggest holiday, Mooncake Festival. Why do you eat the mooncakes? And they said, because it's the Mooncake Festival. Yeah, I get that. But why mooncakes? Because it's the Mooncake Festival. And I'm like, so there's some history behind it, and you have no idea what it is. And the reason that Jews are very smart and very rich is because we know why we do what we do. And that's actually true, I believe. Mm. I mean, mm. I, I was sharing them my culture, but I, I do think there's something to that, that you even have Jews who are secular, who are win the Nobel Prize, because we put value on knowledge. And... Um, also, I think we're blessed by the creator of the universe as well, but, but we do culturally put value on knowledge. So there I was, and I end up teaching two classes on Christmas. 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 They said, yes, you're Jewish, but you're also an American. We want to know about Christmas. And why do they want to know about Christmas? They said, we, you know, in America, they lament the commercialization of Christmas. The Chinese uh, people are yearning for the commercialization of Christmas. They know there's some secret in Christmas that will create Black Friday. They just know it, or Black, uh, yeah, it's called Black Friday. They know there's some way that they can get rich from Christmas. They just need to figure it out and mm. unlock the secret to produce this internal Christmas economy, and every, and then they won't have to de depend on exports, which they're very and concerned about. And so this about. is an expectation. You're talking about the entire student body. This is the oh, this is all Chinese society. Chinese society is yearning for figuring out the secret to Christmas. So I teach two classes on Christmas. The first one I teach about Santa Claus. A Jew teacher. Okay, go ahead. Here I, I am, an hear Israeli this. Jew teaching about Christmas to the Chinese atheists <laughs> who, who tell me, Mayo Shangdi, there's no such thing as God. So I explain about Santa Claus, and really my job is to teach English. So when I tell them about Christmas, I've got to emphasize 
you know, Santa Claus rides a sleigh and I teach them the word sleigh and how it's spelled and what it is. And these are people who come from a subtropical environment. They've only seen uh, sleighs on television. A lot, of, a lot of reindeer <laughs> down there. There's a lot of rain, but not so much reindeer. It once rained for 88 days straight in Changsha. Anyway, but no reindeer. Um, so I tell them about sleigh and Santa Claus and chimney and things that, you know, they didn't know. Even if they culturally knew what a chimney was, they didn't know the word in English. Um, I end up teaching a second class because they wanted more, and I taught them about Yeshua. And, I, you know, they call them in Chinese, Ye Saw. It's a tonal language. I teach them about Ye Saw. And I tell them, Ye Saw was actually this Jewish man who lived 2,000 years ago in Isalia, the country of Israel where I live. And he was a Jewish man named Yeshua. And they said, Laosher, Laosher. They was raising their hand. Oh, oh Laosher, you're confused. Yesua wasn't a Jewish man. Yesua was, he wasn't Yotai Ren, Jewish. He was Jidu Jiao. He was Christian. And I said, no, actually he was, a, unlike Santa Claus, who was a fictitious character, a mythical character. And you have to understand, in their culture, there's a lot of mythical characters. There's millions of gods. And one of their favorite gods is the Chinese god of fortune. He's this man who wears a red coat and has a long black beard. And he gives you a red envelope on the Chinese New Year. And there's money in that red envelope. And this is a very important concept in, in Chinese culture, the red, the red envelope with money. And um, so they pray to the God of fortune, and they get money in the red envelope. And um, so I said, Sounds no. like Jesus in the oh. uh, televangelist <laughs> world. <laughs> well, what I explained to them is that this man who lived 2,000 years ago, Yeshua, isn't like the Chinese God of fortune or like Santa Claus. He was a real person, and he was Jewish. He was a Yo Ren, and his name was Yeshua. And they said, oh, yes, uh, Jewish, very smart, very rich. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, not exactly. <laughs> he was very smart. <laughs> so here's me, the Jew from Israel, trying to teach the Christians about Christmas, which they think they can get rich from. And I'm telling them that Yeshua, Jesus was really Yeshua who lived 2,000 years ago. And they're like, oh, he was a real person? And he was Jewish? It's amazing. <laughs> like, what an, like, what an incredible experience. It was such a blessing. I actually taught one class about Hanukkah. And in the Open Door series, we actually, I think it's the third volume third, third, third here. Volume, it's called yeah. Stand Against the Ban. They got the English language uh, teaching version of Stand Against the Ban. Did I, they? They did. It was amazing. I taught them about how when the the uh, the um, Greeks came to Israel, and here's how I explained it to them, because they, you know, I, I need to explain it to them in terms they'll understand in their culture. So I said, you know, uh, imagine if the Japanese came, because they've got issues with the Japanese yeah. mm -hmm. to this day, um, in some ways even more than the Jews do with the Germans, um, in many ways. Um, I've never heard a Jew say, I hate Germans. My students would very openly say, we hate the Japanese. They just hate them even because of what happened in World War II. Mm -hmm. And so I explained, imagine if the Japanese came and instead of wanting to kill you with swords and guns, they said to you, you must be Japanese, you must speak Japanese, you have to adopt the Japanese culture, and you, and you um, have to speak the Japanese language, what would you do? And my little 15-year-old boy said, we would kill them, and <laughs> little 15-year-old kids. And I said, well, this is what the Greeks wanted to do to the Jews. They didn't want to kill our bodies, they wanted to destroy our souls and make us Greeks. And the way they wanted to do it is they imposed certain laws upon us. And I had to keep this message real simple. I, I brought the three main things. I told them that, you know, first they banned Shabbat. And I said, do you know what that is? And I told them the Chinese word for Shabbat, which is an shirura. And I had, I remember the looks on the, on the children and these students, they, they had these very solemn looks. They said, we know what it is. I said, what, what is it? They said, it's when you're dead. I said, no, it's not when you're dead. Because they think, you know, think about like rest in peace. Oh, An oh, Shiro okay. literally means day of rest. They think it's when you're dead. I explained, no, it's the reason you have a seven day week. And even they have a seven day week. You work six days and rest in the seventh. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, okay, it came from that. And then I explained, and the other thing is they forbade circumcision, the Greeks. And, um, and I tried to explain them what circumcision was. Oh, that must have been. Oh, they'd never heard of this students. concept. Right. They'd never right. heard of this concept. I showed them the Chinese word, they didn't know what that word meant. And I tried to explain to them, and I remember the look of the little girls. I said, so, so you don't have? I'm like, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I literally had to, I'm not kidding, draw a picture on the blackboard, take an eraser, and I remember the looks, why? And I explained, this is a covenant between the God of Israel and the people of Israel going back 4,000 years, and the Chinese people respect that. 
Mm. They understand that concept and they respect it. Um, but their ancestor worship going back. You they know, understand what, what? ancient things from ancient culture. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily know the history behind it, but they respect it right. and they respected this covenant. And then finally I explained, they forbade us to speak the name of the God of Israel, which is what stand against the ban is about. And, and it says this in the ancient sources that this ban on speaking the name Yehovah actually started out as a Greek prohibition to wipe out Judaism. And I explained it and I said to my students, my 658 students, do you know what the name of the God of Israel is? And they all responded, Yehoa. And I was so proud of them. It was amazing. <laughs> what a blessing I had there. It was a great experience in China. Well, then we're going to take a short break right now, as we do in each one of our programs. And this is uh, uh, every week the opportunity. Uh, as these broadcasts go out around the world, we know that uh, uh, you're listening to these uh, sometimes years from when we do them. But still, we need you to stand with us. We are able to get this out to the world through the broadcast channels, through uh, the internet, because of the people who have stood with us in the past to help me get the message to you. If your life is being touched, if you're being changed, we need you to stand with us, to be a part of this ministry. So we don't give you a whole lot of time to do it. You need to make your decision now. You need to stand with us because it is the right thing to do. If we are feeding you, don't muzzle the oxes treading out the corn. We got a lot more corn to tread, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to get to the far reaches of the planet. A short amount of time, the window of opportunity is very small, it's very narrow, and this is your opportunity to put away rewards that you'll be able to pick up on the sea of fire and glass when the smoke clears. We'll be back right after this time for you. school teacher in China, Nehemia Gordon. Uh, Nehemia, 658 uh, high school students. Yeah. Uh, were you in Beijing, a capital? No, no, I mean, it was a big city or no, what? No, this was in a little city called Changsha. It's the capital of Hunan. Changsha has 8 million people. And it's the capital oh. of a province of 65 million, more than Texas and, and California combined. It's considered like a, a medium-sized city. Um, uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, greater than the population of the entire state of Israel. Uh, and I actually told my students that. I said, I live in Israel, Isalia, and it has 7 million people, and you're a city of 8 million. And, you know, um, I did actually end up making it to Beijing, and, and I had an amazing experience there, Michael. I, I, to this day, I'm still trying to process what happened. Um, uh, this, and this was initially when, when we had done the speaking tour, 
um, there was this woman in Beijing who heard, oh, these Hebrew teachers are going to be in, in China and, and they're teaching in Shenzhen, which is, is uh, mainland China, and they're going to visit Beijing. I, I want to meet them. So we meet with this woman and she tells us that she had a dream and in her dream, God appeared to her and told her to keep the Torah. Now imagine this. This is a woman who's in an underground church, has no, you know, the internet in China is blocked. It's filtered. Mm. This is not a person who's part of a Hebrew roots congregation or, you know, or, or, this is a woman who, she just had a dream. And, and she's trying to make sense of it. And so she wants to meet with these Torah teachers, Keith and me, when we go mm. over to Beijing. It was an amazing experience. But, um, you know, one of the experiences I had, Michael, um, towards the end of the year, I uh, ended up going to a place called Xi'an. Xi'an is, um, it was the uh, capital of the uh, first emperor of China. He was a man named Qing Shi Huangdi. It's a tonal language. You got to do the tones. Qing Shi Huangdi became the first emperor of China in 226 BC. And what he does is he creates this massive tomb for himself with uh, 6,000 clay warriors. They call it the terracotta warriors. Mm -hmm. And here we actually have a picture of me standing with the terracotta warriors. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I, I do have to point out which, that those- Which one is you? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I do have to point out that those aren't the, the, the real terracotta warriors. Those are the replicas for the tourists. Oh. The real ones that are behind ropes and they don't let you touch them because they're very fragile. Oh, okay. But the interesting thing about them is, is they're considered one of the wonders of the ancient world today. Um, by archaeologists. And, and the reason they're considered so amazing is that they um, have looked at these terracotta warriors and they found that each of the faces of the terracotta warriors is unique. They've even taken high resolution photos of the ears and each set of ears is unique. And the belief is oh. that Qing Shi Huangdi, he made replicas of actual soldiers. He had mm. these, the, the most brutal soldiers in his army, he wanted to bring with him into the afterlife, so he made these clay warriors representing individual soldiers. And that's why it's considered so amazing. This wasn't mass produced. These were eight, six to 8,000 works of art of individual people. Yeah, yeah. Well, it got me thinking as I was walking around Xi'an and it started me thinking about this verse in the book of Isaiah. And the verse says, I, Isaiah 40 verse 26, it says, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. And it's speaking there about the stars in the heavens. Now, it's an interesting question how many stars there are, actually. Um, it says, he calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. So it got me thinking, the creator of the universe knows every one of the stars in his universe that he created by name. And their number is, is I mean, it's quite literally astronomical. <laughs> they say it might actually be greater than the U.S. deficit, the number of stars in the universe. Um, there's hundreds of billions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies, with each with hundreds of billions of stars. I mean, it's, it's some really big number. And he knows all of them by name. And it got me thinking if Qing Shi Huangdi was this great emperor for making six to 8,000 unique individuals, what about our emperor, our emperor in heaven, who's made seven billion unique individuals who are alive just today? And, 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 I, and I started to realize, I went to China to get away from ministry, to take a break. And here I am in China, this is towards the end of the year, I'd been teaching the class on Passover and Hanukkah, and I've been teaching the class on Sukkot, and I'm walking around Xi'an seeing verses from Isaiah pop into my head, and I get this other verse, and it's the verse of Isaiah 43, verse 1, but now thus says Jehovah who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. And I started thinking, I got on the ship to Tarsus, just like, you know, just like Jonah, running away from ministry, and I can't run away from it. I mean, he's called every one of us by name, and I thought, yeah, he, call, he called me by name, but he's called other people. I don't, I don't, I'm just going to go to China, have a simple life, not deal with all of the, you know, the stress and the tension of ministry and things, and just teach my 658 students. And I got to tell you, though, in some ways, it was very therapeutic. I would teach my classes come home from my class, and I had no other worries in the world. Can you imagine what that's like? Probably can't, being in ministry. <laughs> um, it was really a, a beautiful feeling. But at the end of that year, I decided I just can't do this anymore. I've got to come back to ministry. Mm -hmm. um, he's called me by name. Um, he's called all of us by name. And, and that's a real thing, that he's called all of us 7 billion individuals. And every one of us he's called, we've got to respond to that call. And, yeah. and look, part of my ministry is all, has been for many years about his name. And it got me thinking, names are just so important. He called me by name, and, and I got to call back upon his name and proclaim his name. 
Well, I, I've got to say something here for a moment. Uh, you know, I, I have to talk to talk to our, our folks out there for a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, uh, Nehemia really broke the mold for me. I had a, a paradigm in which, um, you know, I was always uh, under this delusion that the Almighty could only talk to believers, okay? Believers in Yeshua. And the very uh, issue that I brought forth uh, to Nehemia uh, concerning the Matthew 23, I really felt that uh, he was a person that perhaps could help me solve that problem, which I knew was a uh, an incredible problem. It was a real burden on me. And what I saw happen, I saw Nehemiah uh, Gordon led by the Spirit to make these discoveries and to, and to bring forth understandings that I had been searching for for an entire lifetime. And, and that is what broke the mold for me. It's like, okay, the Almighty is not bound by the box that we put him in. He has called us, he's called us by his name and the things that have happened in his life. And I'm gonna ask Nehemiah uh, to be with us again on another episode, uh, uh, you know, after this, because uh, the, his testimony and what happened with his discovery of the name and what transpired, when I heard that, I knew this was from heaven. And so uh, I, I just, I want you to, to hear, I want you to listen up and to hear what he has to say on this, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, uh, Nehemiah, you, you promised that you'd take, uh, take us down the road to Emmaus. And, you know, uh, Michael, I, I think the creator of the universe is messing with us. <laughs> I mean, we have these boxes and we create boxes for, our, you know, for ourselves. We've got the Jewish box and the Messianic box and the Christian box and the Hebrew roots box and the Karite box and the, and the Muslim box. And, and everybody's got to, we got to keep people in their boxes. And, and, um, and I think it makes us feel very comfortable when we have that. But when we yeah, we can up, prejudge stuff oh, uh, people away sure. in these different yeah. boxes oh, and disregard oh, them. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, you, I don't yeah. have to listen to him. He's not right. a believer. I don't have right. to listen to his expertise in Hebrew or anything right. because he's not a believer. Right. Or, or I or, meet you and you say you're messianic and I already know everything about you. But I actually don't know anything about you and your faith until I have a conversation with you. And what we do, I think, when we create boxes for people is we end up putting Yehovah in a box we end up putting the creator in the box. And I love mm -hmm. what you just shared. I'm, I'm humbled by what you just shared, Michael, I have to say. I had an experience like this with, with, um, with my friend Keith Johnson. We went to South Africa. It's the Kai Alicia story. We share it in the Open Door series. You do. Yeah. And, and, I, no, and you got to tell it, though. I got to tell it. So we're there, and, and we end up going to this place called Kai Alicia. It's, it's a township. 400,000 people living in these 10 shacks with uh, or 10 cardboard roofs. Cardboard card boxes. I mean, and they, they would tell us in the winter that, you know, it was very cold and they would use kerosene for their fire, for, for heat. And it would just go up, you know, a whole area of there would just go up like a, like a tinder box. Cause you know, these wooden shacks with tin roofs and, and a difficult place to live. Mm. And they said, you can't go in there. They said, you just go there and they kill you. This is what this lady says to us mm -hmm. in her South African accent. Keith ends up dragging me there and, and we meet this man. He's a Kosa from the Kosa tribe. I'm trying to pronounce the name of the tribe. So and it's got a click. Hebrew, Chinese, no. now Kosa. Oh, I know that. I just, <laughs> I just know that one word, the name of the tribe, Kosa. <laughs> and this man, he meets us. We walk in there. And I, I at first I said, Keith, uh, I can't go with you. And I'll be honest with you, I had Montezuma's revenge. Uh, so I'm like, look, you go there. I'm going to stay at the place. And then I'll meet you at the airport. Because we had a uh, flight to catch out of, out of that place. So I, Keith ends up dragging me there. I'm not even supposed to be there. I decided last minute, okay, I'll go. And so we go and we walk into this uh, church and the pastor's telling us about his experience. He'd actually been a gang leader in this township, found God, um, wanted to have a church, didn't have any money. He ended up, uh, some people donated the bricks, another person donated the mortar. Some of the local people got together and put the mortar and the bricks together. I think I saw that place. I drove you may by have. it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway that's, uh, long story short, he um, tells us his testimony and then he asks us about us. And I start off saying, well, I live in Jerusalem, Israel. And he says, stop, stop, stop. He says, I do you speak Hebrew? And I said, well, yeah, of course I speak Hebrew. I've lived in Israel for 20 years. He says, um, he says, about seven years ago, I had a dream. And in that dream, I saw four letters. And I've always believed those to be Hebrew letters. And, and he said, I've been waiting for someone to ask about this dream. Can you, I mean, imagine this. Here's a man who um, 
he got, has his dream and he's just waiting there in Kyalicha for some Hebrew speaker to walk in. When's that ever going to happen? That should never happen in Kyalicha. Right. And there I am. In, and, I, and now you have to understand, if you say to somebody, an English speaker, I've got, I, had a, I have a four-letter word. It's not a good word. But in Hebrew, we talk about Shem Dalalotiot, the four-letter name, the four-letter word. It's immediate association. That's the name Yudhevave. So I ask him, I said, Do you have a pen and pencil and paper? His son go, brings a pencil. I write Yudhevave, show it to the man. And he looks, he says, uh, not exactly. It's a little bit similar, but no, it's, it's not really what I saw. I'm like, all right, I don't know what he saw in his dream. Maybe it wasn't Hebrew, maybe it was, you know, some other language, maybe it was Zulu. Um, and um, so Keith runs out to the car, brings back this book he's written, which has Yudhe Vavhe emblazoned across the front. And the man looks at it, and, and you have to remember, I have horrible penmanship. I've always, uh, back in eighth grade, my teacher used to yell at me every day because of my penmanship. So Keith's point is, how is he going to read your chicken scratches when you try to write Hebrew? He shows him the Yudhe Vavhe in the nice, beautiful blocks print. And the man says, that is what I saw. Those are the four letters. Now, that really challenged me, that experience, mm. because mm. I had created a box for me. I've got the Karite box, and I'm very comfortable with it. And you're the Messianic, and Keith is the Methodist who, doesn't, who keeps Shabbat and doesn't eat pork for some reason. And, you know, you've got all these little boxes for people. What I realized, though, is the box wasn't just for me. Really, the box was for God. I had tried to put God in a box and say, look, I know, God, this is what you do. You talk to... Um, Jewish prophets in caves, on hilltops, in the desert, you certainly don't talk to black close-up pastors in a township in South Africa. I know you don't, but he did. And it, got, it blew me away because here you have, this man had the inspiration, but he didn't have the information. There's no way he's going to have the opportunity to learn Hebrew in the mm -hmm. township in Kyalicha. I have the information, but I didn't have the dream he had. And God knew that one day I would walk into there, even though I wasn't supposed to be there, and put the inspiration together with the, in, with the information, and that would produce revelation. And to me, that was, that was, a, that was like a, a pivotal moment in and my that's, journey. That's what you have to do. You, you can't get away from it. You've been called to do that. You're doing what you're supposed to do, and the Holy Spirit... All over the world does. What I mean, the God's going to do what He wants to do, and I tried to stuff Him back in that box, and He just wouldn't. He wouldn't cooperate. Now I want to tell you about the road to Emmaus, Michael, because that's the context for it, um, boy. And that was um, uh, that event in Kyalicha was like 2010. Now, now two years ago, 2014, I'm in China. I've spent a year there. I had my Xi'an experience, where I, I realize I can't get away from ministry, and so I make the decision I'm coming back to Israel and then to do some ministry in the US. And so I contact the people in Hong Kong and I'd been to Hong Kong to speak on a number of occasions. I had already spoken in Hong Kong with Keith. I went back myself um, later and this was the third time I was coming to Hong Kong and I said to them, I'll come and speak if you want over a weekend before I go back because I don't plan to ever go back to China. Um, and they said, okay, we'll set up an event. I was really busy. I was packing my stuff and moving, getting preparing to leave China after a year. Um, it's amazing how much stuff you amass in just one year, you could imagine. Um, and I've got a, a, all these arrangements. I had some travel after China I wanted to do. I was going to five countries in Southeast Asia. So I've got to do all of that in a period of a very, you know, a few weeks and the Hong Kong thing. So I didn't check the schedule when I went to Hong Kong. Big mistake. I, they ended up scheduling me to speak for 10 hours over Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I ended up speaking for 12. <laughs> you know how that is. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I speak for 12 hours, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, at the end of my speaking event, these two Christians walk up to me from mainland China, a man and a woman. And you have to remember in Hong Kong, there's freedom of speech to some extent maybe as much as there is in the U.S. these days. Um, but in mainland China, there's no pretending about freedom of speech. You know there's certain things you're not allowed to say, and you just keep your mouth shut. And one of those things is religion. you, you got to be very careful who you talk to religion about. Um, and even if they ask you, you have to be careful what you answer, You know, which is the beauty of me teaching in the high school. I wasn't teaching religion. I was teaching Jewish culture mm -hmm. <laughs> and ancient history, um, even though it's from the Bible. Um, Anyway, so I meet these two Christians from mainland China in Hong Kong, and they walk up to me after 12 hours of teaching, and they say, did we understand correctly that you're Jewish? And I'm like, 
I just thought for 12 hours. You're not sure if I'm Jewish? And part of it was that I was speaking in English. It was being translated into Cantonese and then from Cantonese into Mandarin. Um, and they had some English, but it was a little bit lost in translation. I said, yeah, I'm Jewish. They say, this is wonderful. We've got some good news for you. I say, really, what's the good news? What do you think the good news was? The good news was Isaiah 53. Your Messiah has come. And I said, okay. Uh, and we sat till two in the morning talking about this. And throughout this conversation, I, I underst uh, they explained to me where they were coming from. Where they were coming from is they were both recovering addicts. Um, and it's a fact in their lives you can't argue with. It's just a fact they know that they were saved from addiction, from death, by Yesaw, who they call Yeshua, Jesus, Yesaw, saved them from addiction. That's just something they know happened in their lives. It's not disputable. And they try to share that with people in mainland China. And the people in mainland China are like, so Yesaw saved you from drugs, and the god of fortune gave me a red envelope full of money. Like, who cares? And they say, no, no, you don't understand. He's a, a fulfillment of the ancient prophecies of the Yotai Ren, the Jewish people. And the Chinese people say, we're not Yotai Ren, we're not Jews, what do we care? <laughs> so they meet me and they think, okay, you're Jewish. All we have to do is tell you the words Isaiah 53 and instantly you'll be a Christian. This is how they thought. Mm -hmm. And so we're having this conversation and I said to them, look, I've read Isaiah 53 in Hebrew and in Aramaic and in Greek but what would you like to tell me about Isaiah 53 from, the, era, from the, the Chinese and the English? And we sit, like I said, till two in the morning talking about this. And I could see in the conversation at a certain point, they were very frustrated with me. They were very angry. They couldn't understand how when they read Isaiah 53, it was just so clear what it meant. And here I was reading it in the original Hebrew and didn't see what they saw. They were, and they were actually angry at one point. You know, they were yelling at me. And this part of this is through a translator. Part of it is in Chinese with my limited Mandarin and their limited English. And they were, they were saying, oh, you see it, you must know he's the Messiah. Why are you denying it? And I was saying, look, I don't see what you see. And here's how I tried to explain it to them, Michael. And, and I shared with them Luke 24, the road to Emmaus. And um, well, that's uh, that's interesting because yeah. that, that is what uh, this year for Passover. Yeah, that is what I was compelled to do is to do the the story. Yeah, uh, the road to Emmaus, oh, yeah. and I I did it as a kind of a one man play in which oh, really? I was the not Cleopas but the unnamed disciple. Okay, <laughs> and I, I believed that he was unnamed cool. so yeah. that I could play him. <laughs> I so love that. that's awesome. Uh, so yeah. You know, so this is uh, you know th this you look is, like the unnamed disciple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little older than he was, but anyway, I, I, I play it because you know the, this story is, is just mm. very very precious to me. Yeah. And and yeah. so now you know th this yeah. is something. You know, a lot of people don't know. I mean, uh, Nehemiah. You know, he yeah. reads. Uh, you know, when he studies the Gospels, you know, he he reads it through. He reads it in Greek. He reads it in English. He reads it. Well, what we have in Hebrew. He I don't reads read it, it in Chinese. In I'll be honest with not, you. Not in Chinese, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, he's a, a real student of, of mm -hmm. this, and to understand what Yeshua is teaching. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, yes, so listening to for, forward to uh, going down the road with you here. And, you know, I've actually been to Emmaus and, um, and I'm sure you have as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, we, we have the main highway from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. It's called Kfish Misparachad, road number one. And on road number one is the Latrun interchange. And just above Latrun interchange on the hillside is this village, which up until 1967 was called Imwas and earlier Emmaus. And it's an ancient Jewish village. And um, so they're walking on the main road from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, passing through Emmaus. Uh, and the story is that these people are, these two disciples of Yeshua are walking on the third day. And what I love about this image, and this has to be on purpose, this happening, is they're walking on the road. It's a journey of faith. Um, and they're, but they're walking on a literal road as well. And, um, and, and by the way, I want to I tell the listeners that this is homework. Go to Luke 24 verses 13 to 31. Actually, read the entire Gospel of Luke, but get this in its context. Read all of Luke 24, because we're just going to touch upon some of it. Mm -hmm. I know we're running out of time. And, and, and uh, so. again, part of the uh, of the context here, yeah. here are two disciples yeah. that are so despondent and hurt, they leave Jerusalem during the feast. Oh, uh, this is Feast of upset. Unleavened Bread. They're depressed. It's all over but the crying. They're upset and they're depressed. And the story is in Luke 24 that a third man joins them and asks them, why are you guys so upset? Why are you depressed? What happened that made you so sad? 
And it says in verse 18, it says, Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, and who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Yeshua, but he doesn't recognize him, mm -hmm. according to the Gospel of Luke. Mm -hmm. He says, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things that happened there in these days? In other words, in modern terms, he's like, haven't you checked Facebook? How do you not know what's going on in Jerusalem? And I love how he says, he goes on, uh, he says, and he said to them, what things? Yeshua says, you know, yeah, what like, things? Like he didn't know? <laughs> like, like I don't know. Uh, so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. And I have to say, Michael, one of the things I really love about this is how authentic this sounds. In other words, it, if this was being made up, uh, in the time of Constantine, it would have been a very different uh, conversation. They, they would have said, how concerning Jesus, who was the second person of a triune deity who came manifest on earth. Now, maybe they believed that. I'm not saying whether they believed it or not. But that wouldn't be a conversation three Jews would be having on the road to Emmaus. Right, um, right. Not with a, certainly an outsider who would be like, what are you talking about? Um, so he was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. The people loved him is what they're describing. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. And then they said in verse 21, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And this is what I, what I tried to explain to these two Christians from mainland China. When they said we were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel on the road to Emmaus on the third day from the crucifixion, what they're really saying is our hopes have been shattered. We're disappointed because as far as we know right now at this point, at this stage of the road to Emmaus, he's failed the prophecies. Or more importantly, he's failed what we expected him to do. Mm -hmm. And this is profound to me because these were disciples of Yeshua who ate with him, who broke bed with him, who sat at his feet, studying with him, walked around with him, and they were hoping he would redeem Israel. What did they expect? So look, it's the same expectation that Jews today expect. Most Jews today are expecting the Messiah who will be a descendant from King David. Messiah means anointed one who will be anointed with oil. He'll be the king from the line of David who will sit as a flesh and blood king and he'll accomplish three main things. He'll defeat the enemies of Israel, gather in the exiles, and bring peace to, excuse me, bring peace to the world. Isaiah 2, they'll beat their swords into plowshares. As far as I can tell, based on the news that's going on these days, Isaiah 2 hasn't been fulfilled yet with the beating the swords into plowshares. Um, I think we're going mm -hmm. in the other direction, unfortunately, yeah. these days. So when they said we were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel, what they're saying is, look, we had these messianic expectations, like all the Jews did back then, and he didn't fulfill those expectations. Now, as I explained to the, Chinese, the two Chinese Christians, I said, didn't they read Isaiah 53? And my point wasn't to say they were wrong about Isaiah 53. We're referring to a risen... Messiah. My point was that you say it's so obvious. It wasn't obvious to the disciples who lived with Yeshua and knew him during his ministry on earth. And not only wasn't it obvious, they're upset because he didn't fulfill what they know he's supposed to, to, to fulfill. Now, if that was the end of the story, you know, you should be getting really nervous, but it's not the end of the story. And I know that, um, I've actually shared this in some places, and people will grab the pastor in the back and say, you got to stop him, he's speaking against Yeshua. I'm actually sharing the message in Luke 24. This is the message of the Gospel of Luke and the road to Emmaus. This isn't something I made up, it's right there. It goes on, they said, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company, who they didn't believe, arrived at the tomb early, astonished us. Why did they astonish them? Because the tomb was empty. Hadn't he said to them in Galilee, in the Gospel of Luke, if I remember correctly, he said to them that he would die and rise in the third day? Mm -hmm. They had heard that. They didn't take that seriously. He didn't mean that. Surely he didn't mean that. Surely that was a symbolic language of meaning he would defeat the enemies of Israel and gather in the exiles and bring peace to the world. That had to be what it meant. And this is the whole point of the story of, of the road to Emmaus. That after this, at the end of this process, Yeshua explains to them a new understanding they didn't have before. It says he, at that point, as they continued to walk, explained to them all the things concerning himself in the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms, meaning the writings, the Tanakh. And the point is that until he explained those things to them, they didn't know those things. And my point to these Christians from Hong Kong, from mainland China, um, in Hong Kong, was that you think you understand Isaiah 53 because you're so clever, because God saved you from drugs. But actually, according to the Gospel of Luke, Luke you only understand what that means because it's been revealed to you. And my point is, I want to know the truth, whatever that is. 
And if God wants to reveal to me his Messiah, I will gladly accept that. And I'll be so happy. I'll be jumping for joy because I'll have the truth. But he hasn't revealed that to me. And I'm walking on the road to Emmaus. And I want to show this, this, this picture and end with this. I was on driving on the highway on the road to Emmaus on the way to the airport. And there was a roadblock at two in the morning, Michael. And it was the Israeli police looking for somebody. Um, and it got me thinking, here I am driving on the road to Emmaus. And the literal police are there trying to stop people. And out there, there are spiritual police that are trying to stop people on their spiritual journey as they walk on the road to Emmaus. I'm not going to let the spiritual police stop me, Michael. I'm going to go on that road and take it wherever it leads, wherever the creator of the universe has in store for me, wherever he wants mm -hmm. to take me. And, and those who are angry at me for not believing in Yeshua, don't be angry at me. I want to know the truth, whatever the creator has in store for me, whatever he'll reveal to me. Can I end with a prayer, Michael? Do we have time please, for please a prayer? Do. Please do. And this is a prayer from Psalm 119, verse 18. It says, uncover my eyes that I may see the wonderful hidden things of the Torah. What I love about that prayer is this is King David, after he's anointed with oil, we're told the spirit of Yehovah rested upon him. And even with the spirit of Yehovah upon him, he could pray the prayer, asking God to uncover his eyes and reveal things. And if David could come with that kind of humility before the creator of the universe, surely I can. And I come before the Father, and I, I'm asking everyone out there who's watching this, pray for me. I ask you in sincerity. I want to know the truth. Join me in this prayer. Yehovah, Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, Borei Olam, creator of the universe. I want to know your truth. Father, I believe there will be a descendant of King David who will sit on the throne and will be the Mashiach, the Messiah. And Father, I want to know that Messiah. Father, I believe that Mashiach of yours will be your son. I believe as you spoke to Solomon, I will be his father and he will be my son. That Mashiach in the end time will come. He'll be your son and he will defeat the enemies of Israel, gather in the exiles and bring peace to the world. And Father, I need him in my life now. I genuinely do. I come before you in humility and I ask you to reveal your truth, whatever truth it is you have for me, Father, as I walk on this road to Emmaus. I won't let the spiritual border patrol stop me. I won't let the religious police stop me, Father. I want you to reveal that truth to me in sincerity. I ask this. It's up to you. I'm yearning for your truth. Show me whatever that truth is. I'd love to know who the Messiah is and to have him now, today, in our world and in my life. And I ask this in your holy name, Yehovah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Join us again next week because we're going to have Nehemia back as he continues on his God-given ministry of proclaiming the name, and you are going to take the journey with him. You are going to watch it unfold before you, and uh, we will see you next Shabbat Night Live. Lehitzrot. On the road to Shabbat a mess. Shalom. Wait, where do you think you're going? You're not done yet. You gotta subscribe if you wanna see more of this stuff. Just click the button up here. Better yet, you can click here to watch more right now. And if you like what you see, support what we do. Donate here to keep the broadcast coming. Thank you.